a way to That'll be today, two o'clock in the cafe for those who are interested. And uh, on Friday uh, in the cafe, next this week, there will be a small group meeting. Uh, the purpose is to invite uh, new guests, so set up uh, to accommodate the guests, the Japanese missionaries. And so currently there are about 15 people attending regularly. Um, so you, you're welcome to attend that. Please come and support. And on Saturday the 18th of October at 4 p.m., Joanna Hartle is celebrating her birthday. In, uh, at her home in 76 Studland Road in Hanwell. So yeah, I'm sure you're welcome to uh, attend that. Uh, if you could talk to Joanna for more information. And um, on at Sunday, four at four o'clock, sorry. And uh, Sunday the 19th of October at 7.30 in the Kent Room, there'll be a testimony from Mr. Sabayo Sabambi, uh, which will be lovely, I'm sure. And um, yeah, so we can learn more about uh, his life and, and through sharing together learn about each other's lives. And also there is home service next Sunday and uh, tomorrow as Chris said already there's a uh, study of Islam happening tomorrow in the, in the cafe. And also today at 1.30 there is a meeting about creating a pastoral care team here in uh, the ballroom I should think. Uh, Simon's sort of pioneering models of shared leadership so, you know, having all of us need to become leaders in our own rights. And so more particularly, what does this mean for pastoral care and how, how can we share that? And also, I'm sure many of you have heard about the recent blessing of uh, Yonjanim or Cat Moon. And uh, uh, was it Norwegian gentleman called uh, Jan Daube? And um, I'm sure we want to congratulate them all regardless of the way you feel that it was announced, perhaps. And um, there will be a card uh, going around, so we can all congratulate them uh, on their uh, marriage blessing. And, yeah, as I think Auntie Rake has also bought some chocolates for them. So we can... Marriage is something to be celebrated, so let's celebrate it. And so now we have... Uh, the band are going to lead us in a few more songs. Uh, so let's prepare our hearts and minds uh, for the sermon. Lift our voices. Praise. Yep. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, so it's nice to, we've got, to see we've got a packed house. There are um, a few seats at the front if you want a better um, seat for the message. Um, if you'd like to peer into the eye of the speaker, um, so feel free. Um, but until then, please rise and let's um, sing a few more songs. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And 
welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. you with praise almighty god of love be welcomed in this place we welcome you with praise we welcome you with praise almighty god of love be welcomed in this place let every heart adore let every soul away almighty god of love be welcomed in this place we welcome you with praise we welcome you in praise, Almighty God of love. Be welcomed in this place. Thank you. I was wondering what the title of my sermon was supposed to be. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so this is um, Willem, Willem Haynes, apparently. <coughs> anyway, good morning, everyone. Yeah, nice to see you all. I haven't seen a lot of you for a long time. <sighs> I don't know why I'm doing here, standing here. Honestly, it's so difficult to stand and give a sermon because I never know what I'm going to say. Sometimes I prepared the sermon in the past and I stood up and I couldn't say what I was going to say and just another sermon appeared out of nowhere. And uh, it's so difficult sometimes to know what to say. In the past it was much easier. In the past everything seemed much clearer. We looked at the way that God's providence was unfolding. Our movement, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was very obvious where God was working, where Satan is working. But now things seem to be a lot uh, less clear. And we look at the state of our movement itself, it seems to be a lot less clear than it was all those years ago. Lots of very confusing things going on and lots of weird theology appearing out of different places. And one wonders, how does one deal with all this sort of stuff? How does one you know, keep one's faith in that sense? How does one process all the rubbish that goes on? Um, sometimes people just put their head in the sand and they say, I don't want to know. And uh, sometimes people say, you shouldn't ask questions like that. Well, that's not me. I'm always asking questions and uh, I'm always reading all the rubbish that appears because I want to know what's going on and then having to read it all, process it, think about it, try to make sense of it, trying to discern for myself where, you know, what is happening and where one should go. Anyway, so I'm supposed to be talking about Jethro's wisdom. And he was certainly a lot wiser than me. Anyway, so yesterday, by the way, what today was yesterday? Anybody do you remember? Saturday, October. Pardon? Saturday, October. Thank you. Okay, from a religious point of view, what was it? Oh. Uh, it was Eid al Hadda. Okay, that's, that's right. Any, any other ones? There's also Yom Kippur. And what's October the 4th in our calendar? Anybody remember? My birthday. Congratulations. <laughs> and happy, many happy returns of the day. And anything else? Well, I have an October the 4th in 1976. I'm sure David remembers. No? Wasn't that the day of God's eternal blessing declared? 
after Washington Monument. Anyway, so lots of days happening, lots of things, events taking place. And all these things are things that happen when? In the past, sometimes thousands of years ago. So what happened at Yom Kippur? What was Yom Kippur celebrating? Anybody know? Well, when the Moses led the people out of Egypt, then God said to them, you know, you should keep my commandments and you should love the God, Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength and all your heart. And you should teach your children about all the wonderful things that I have done. Okay? So when God led the Hebrews out of Egypt, he gave them just two commandments, love God and teach your children. Okay? So that's why the Jewish people still exist today. They love God and they teach their children. And they pass on the tradition through the generations. So Judaism then is an unusual religion because it's based upon the family. Not the synagogue, not a priesthood. It's just everything is passed on through the family. And so that's what God told the people. Love God and teach your children. And anyway, when they arrived in, at uh, Mount Sinai, he gave them a rather formal, more formal set of commandments. Anybody remember what the first one was? Nope. 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 <laughs> and you would have time for a drink here. What, what was the first commandment? No, almost. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay. What was the second commandment? Remember the first one, yeah? The first one is more important than the second. No, that was way down there. No, the second one is you shall not make any graven image. Okay, shouldn't have any idols. Okay, and so the people, then they agreed not to have any gods before God and to not to make any idols, worship any idols. And the Moses went up the, te up the, the, the mountain to get these laws inscribed in stone and meanwhile what happened down below they had, a party. Hmm? they had a party had a party that's right they had a party they all went wild and what else did they do that's right they made a golden calf and Aaron proclaimed said these are the gods that led you out of Egypt and then when God heard this do you think he's happy about what was happening? So, if people broke the commandment, those commandments, the punishment was supposed to be death. And so, this is what happened. God said to Moses when he's on the mountain, go down from the mountain because your people, listen to this, your people, the people you brought out of Egypt, have ruined themselves. They've quickly turned away from the things I commanded them to do. They've made for, them, for themselves a calf covered with gold, and they've worshipped it and offered sacrifices to it. And they've said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen these people. I know they're very stubborn. So now, do not stop me. I'm so angry with them, I'm going to destroy them and then I'll make of you and your descendants a great nation. So God's not too pleased, because they've broken the commandment and the oath that goes along with these, that the punishment for making, a gold, for making an idol, worshipping an idol, was to be death. But Moses begged the Lord your, his God and said, Lord, don't let your anger destroy your people who you brought out of Egypt with your great power and strength. So when God had been speaking to Moses, had God been taking responsibility? God was saying, go down from the mountain because your people, the people you brought out of Egypt, in other words, are nothing to do with me. These are the people you brought out. But Moses, in arguing with God, says, actually, God, they're your people. And you brought them out of Egypt with your great miracles and your great power and strength. And then Moses said, reminded God, <clears throat> You know, they're your people, don't forget. You can't wash your hands of them. 
And then Moses said to God, don't let the people of Egypt say, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt for an evil purpose. He planned to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the earth. So stop being angry and don't destroy your people. In other words, he's saying, look, God, think about your reputation. If people hear about what you've done, you've taken them all the way out of, out of Egypt and then you decided to destroy them in the desert, that's going to really give you a bad reputation. <laughs> think about it. Reputation is really important. So don't get angry. Stop being angry. Etc., etc. And so the Lord changed his mind and did not destroy the people as he said he might. And so Moses then he goes down to the people explains to them that he's really angry and uh, then he says to the people you've done a terrible sin now I'll go up to the Lord maybe I can do something so your sins will be removed <clears throat> so Moses went back to the Lord and said how terribly these people have sinned they made for themselves gods from gold now please forgive them this sin and if you will not then erase my name from the book in which you've written the name of your people and so Moses then, he engages in a conversation with, with God, and he confronts God, and he challenges God. And he says to God, you know, you want to wipe these people out, and you want to give me a new people, but I don't want to be part of that. You can wipe me out, block me out of your book of life. And so Moses then has to engage with a way of how, to, how is he going to persuade God to change his mind, but then also he has to help God to break his own oath. Can God break the law? If God makes an oath, does he have to carry it out? So how does Moses then help God to break his own oath? So Moses says to God, look God, <clears throat> one of the um, commandments that you gave me last week was that if a person breaks an oath, they, they can be released from an oath they've made if they can think that those consequences, the consequences, if they didn't know the consequences that would come from that oath. So for example, suppose you make a promise and you promise, I'm going to come to church every Sunday this year. And then suddenly, your job sends you to work in Sheffield or in a different city, and you can't go to church every Sunday that year. So you're breaking your oath. And so in the Bible it says, if you can be released from that oath if the consequences of what you were going to follow on from this weren't what you were expecting in that sense. And so Moses then says to God, look God, sit down. I'm going to be the wise man, the sage. If you thought that you would end up destroying all your people when you set up this oath you made, would you have made that oath? And God, of course, said, no, I, you know, I had no idea they were going to break this oath, this, this law, this commandment I gave them. So if I'd realized that, I certainly wouldn't have made an oath to destroy them and to punish them in that way. All right, said Moses, in that case, I release you from your oath. Isn't this amazing? So this is the kind of encounter that God had with Moses. He argued with Moses, discussed with Moses. He spoke to, Moses spoke to God face to face. Yeah? There was no distance between Moses and God in the way he communicated with God. Yeah? When you read the Bible, it's really shocking, to be honest, the kind of conversations you read there between Moses and God, between Abraham and God, the kind of intimacy that there was. And so Yom Kippur, then, is the day when Jews fast for 25 hours in the day. Um, and they're released from all the oaths in which they made and which they were unable to keep. Because if God can be released from all his oaths, then they can also be released from all their oaths and they can be forgiven for anything they've done wrong. Anyway, let's go back to um, Jethro. And so Moses then, as I said, he led the people out of Egypt and before they got to Mount Sinai, um, Moses was um, basically the leader. And, uh, but, you know, when he'd arrived and uh, set up his tent, Jethro, who was his father-in-law, came to see him and brought with him his wife and his two sons. And then they <clears throat> sat in the tent, they had a feast, the party, and Moses told Jethro about all the amazing things that had taken place and all the plagues and all the 
you know, the, all these extraordinary things and the parting of the Red Sea, and Jethro is really enthralled by what was going on anyway. The stories went on way into the night. Yeah, the next morning, Moses got up, and it says here in Exodus, on the morrow, next morning, Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood about Moses from morning till evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw that all he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand about you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between a man and his neighbor. I make them know the statutes of God and his decisions. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you're doing is not good. Where, does that, where else does uh, that expression, not good, come in the Bible? Remember Genesis 2? Very good, excellent. God said to Adam, God said to himself, it's not good that man should be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. And so on that basis, then, God created Eve. Okay, so it's only two times that the, the expression not good actually occurs in the Bible. So it's not good, then, to be alone. Anybody here like to be alone? No, oh, loneliness is terrible. My mother, you know, she didn't like living alone in her house. And so she was always out visiting people, going to lunch, going to the hairdresser, getting her nails done, and going sitting in cafes the last you know, years of her life. Um, but she hated to be alone in her house. And then she tried to move here to England. And, uh, but then whenever she went to around the village where we live, and she went to the cafe, nobody recognized her. Nobody noticed her. And she always felt very alone. Whereas when she was at home in South Africa, whenever she went to the shopping center or the, anywhere, there were people there who recognized her. And so, you know, when you're recognized, you feel like you exist. If nobody recognizes you or recognizes that you are there, it's almost as if you don't exist. In that sense, you become very lonely. And so Jethro then said, it's not good. What you're doing is not good. Not to be, you shouldn't be alone. You and the people with you will wear yourselves out, for well, the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to perform it alone. Listen now, so you have to perform it. My wife's second favorite word is together. And that's really important, actually, because you can see so many mistakes are made in the Bible when people did things alone, by themselves. It, it, thank you, I needed that. <laughs> it is time to get up. And so, for example, you know, if we, did, I, did I ever talk to you about the story of Isaac and Rebecca? You remember Isaac wanted to bless his sons? Okay. Who should have given the blessing to Jacob and Esau? Isaac and Rebecca. What was the problem? Isaac wanted to give the Isaac was planning to give the blessing to his sons by himself. Yeah, do you remember? And so he said to Esau, I'm going to give you my blessing, but first go and make me a nice lunch. And Rebecca only overheard Isaac saying this to Esau. So they hadn't woken up in the morning, got out of their sleeping bags, had a little prayer, said, What are we going to do today? And Isaac would have said, well, I'm planning, I think it's, I'm going to be nice to bless our kids today. And then they would have said, well, who's going to, you know, bless them? And so Isaac and Rebecca should have blessed their children together. And because Isaac had it all worked out in his head, but he didn't communicate and explain it to his wife, then his wife got the wrong end of the stick and everything went seriously wrong. Okay. And so it's very important then to do things together, husband and wife. Especially. Right. Things to, you're not able to perform it alone. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall teach them the statutes, that's the laws, and the decisions, that's the precedents, 
in English law, and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, choose able men from all the people, such as fear God, men who are trustworthy and who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as rulers of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. So who's good at maths here? Okay, so how many, how many group leaders were there then? Out of a thousand, how many people were leaders? No. Okay, I'll go through it again. Just remember what it is. You will divide the people up over the people as rulers of thousands, of hundreds. So the thousand will be divided into how many hundreds? Ten, Ten hundreds. Of fifties and of tens. So how many leaders are there altogether? 131. 131. Who was that? Very good. <laughs> That's right, and so that's about one in eight of the Jewish people then were leaders. All of them then had a responsibility. All of them were there. And so what, Moses, what Jethro suggested to Moses is to delegate it, delegate everything. And so everyone then, or many, many people then, have an opportunity to become involved in the decision-making process. And so amongst a group of ten people, there'd be one person who would be like the group leader or facilitator. And then if there was an argument amongst that little group of ten people, then he would be like the judge. And the point is, he has to be someone who's trustworthy. So this group of ten have to, amongst themselves, figure out, this person is the one who we trust the most, and he can't be bribed to give the wrong decision. Um, and then, of course, you know, after a while, this person who's in charge of this ten, there may be... A thing he can't decide. He's not quite sure what the best decision should be. So then he would go and talk to the person who was in charge of the fifties. And so then there would be some kind they would have a discussion, all the people in charge of these tens, plus the one in charge of the fifty, and they said, Well, if we get this kind of case coming up, what should we all what should we decide? So we have a consistent decision precedent for this particular kind of case. And if they couldn't decide, they said, well, let's go and talk to the bloke in charge of the hundred. And if they couldn't decide, let's go and talk in, to the bloke in charge of the thousand. And so in this way, then, you'd have this way of making decisions so that justice and clear rules could be you know, implemented throughout the whole of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. You think that's a good system? And so a huge number of people then were participating in the administration, the running of the community. It wasn't a one-man band, a one-man show. Because had Moses just spent all day doing that, he would have become completely worn out. And quite often, to be honest, in our own movement, we've often had this, you know, leadership has often been just a one-man band. You know, one person expected to do everything and nobody else does anything. You know, for all kinds of reasons. And often the person who's in charge just gets worn out and you know nowadays you put your hand up if you ask for volunteers who would like to be a, a pastor who would be like to be a leader the main thing that's noticeable is the absence of hands volunteers because so often in the past it's just been you know a one-man band the expectation is the leader should do everything and people get worn out nobody wants to be worn out Anyway, so Jethro then said, look, you know, you only need to make the important things, give the important announcements, make the, f you know, be like the Supreme Court in that sense. And so this meant that everyone had a, a chance to be participating and involved in the community. So everyone there had a chance to be responsible. So being responsible means you have the opportunity to respond, to make choices, to make decisions. Yeah? And so one out of eight people then, had the opportunity to be involved in the running of the community, to be making choices, making decisions, yes? It wasn't just one person making all decisions, but almost everybody had an opportunity to be involved in the decision-making process. And that's why Chaim Wiseman, who was, oh, anyway, I don't know if it was him, hey, one of the presidents of Israel said, the trouble with Israel, he said, is a country where everybody thinks they're a president. And they're always arguing with each other, and they're always bickering, because they all think they're, you know, and that's just the way it is. They all have the sense of, I'm responsible. I should be making the decision. I want to be involved. And that's the way it is. I don't think it's a problem our community suffers from, unfortunately. <laughs> it would be a nice problem. 
And uh, anyway, so these are some of the things that um, you know we're trying to work out. Then you know how are we going to move our community onto a onto another level? So again, when the Israel when the Hebrews came out of Egypt, who was doing all the hard work? Who was doing the heavy lifting? Who did all these extraordinary miracles, the calamities? Moses. Well, he didn't do it himself. God was doing the work. I mean, Moses just put his, his, his stick out and the Red Sea parted. <laughs> he didn't have to get some you know, heavy-duty pumps to pump out the place. So God, in that sense, was doing all kinds of amazing things. And so in that sense, the people were in a state of dependency. They were like children. And if you're in a state of dependency, what's your general attitude towards life? What? Irresponsible. You're irresponsible. So people who are, irres who are not able to be responsible are irresponsible because somebody else is doing all the work. They're in a state of dependency. And what do people who are dependent often do if things go wrong? Complain. complain. Always complaining. Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? Yes? So able to see all kinds of problems and things that are wrong, but thinking somebody else should solve them and someone else should be fixing them. And so as the Hebrews came out of Egypt, despite all these amazing things that took place, they were complaining a lot. And part of the reason, of course, is they've been in a state of slavery in Egypt. And as slaves, you don't take the initiative. You're expected just to obey orders. And so in a slave society, the highest virtue is what? Obedience. Obedience. Yeah? That's the highest virtue a slave can exhibit is obedience. Yeah, so what do you think the favorite virtue of Satan is? No. He wants people to be obedient or disobedient? He wants people to be obedient. When you have dictators, they want all the people who they're dictating to to be obedient. Okay, it's a curious thing, paradox actually, that God's providence started not from obedience, but from disobedience. Why was Moses alive? Why was Moses' life saved? because the midwives who were supposed to kill the little boys were disobedient. They didn't obey the Pharaoh, etc., etc. Yeah. Anyway, so God then is looking for people who are going to listen and are going to follow the original mind and follow their conscience, do what they know is right. In that sense, being responsible. And so anyway, as the people came out of Egypt, they had this complaining attitude, quite a lot of people, <coughs> and uh, because you know, there wasn't enough food, <clears throat> the you know, McDonald's wasn't open, etc., etc., and there wasn't enough water, and uh, so they were complaining a lot. Because up until then, God had been doing everything, and so they expected God to carry on doing everything. The turning moment actually appeared <coughs> when they had to fight against the Amalekites. Sorry, okay, okay. I haven't got a clock anywhere, so maybe that's good. You're reminding me what the time is. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. What is the time? Sorry? Okay. 11.55. 11.55, thank you. Gosh, time flies. Okay, so one of the first things that happened, they came across this group called the Amalekites, who are a nasty little bunch. <clears throat> and then Moses told Joshua to lead the people in the fight against the Amalekites. And Moses himself, he went and sat on a hill and stretched out his arms. And a couple of his you know, helpers came and propped his arms up. And the people fought. And at the end of this fight, it says that Joshua won. And so the point here is, this is the very first time the Hebrews took responsibility. God didn't fight for them. God didn't win the battle. They actually fought themselves. And the, if you remember the story, anyway... At one point, Moses' arms started going down. The people started to lose courage, and they started to be lose on the losing. And then Moses had his arms propped up, and they got more courage, and then they started fighting. And so here the lesson is, <clears throat> if you look up <clears throat> to God, and your heart is lifted up, you have a good morale, and then you can fight and you'll win. Yeah? So it's not the size of the army that determines an outcome of a battle. As we know from the times of Nobody French here, I hope. Agincourt and Cressé, and one can name them all. <laughs> it's just a small band of warriors, as Henry V said, a band of brothers. 
yes, who have a good heart and you know, full of hope and determination, can defeat a huge army. And this is actually one of the reasons in the Bible where it was regarded as being a sin. God said to, um, you know, one of the commandments was, you shall not have a census among the people. In other words, you shouldn't count how many people there are. Because God's vision was, the whole, was that the people of Israel should be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests, and they were to transform and change the world. But do you think there are very many of them? Tiny little number. And if you did a census, you counted up how many people there actually were, and you thought, gosh, there's only a handful of us here, then you can think, well, you know, how can we make a difference? And so that's why God said you shouldn't have a census. And actually told off one of the kings who did conduct a census. Anyways, there aren't many of us here either. But, uh, and, you know, things often don't go the way we expect. But as we can see through the, the Old Testament tradition, God works all kinds of miracles, but gradually more and more, God withdraws from being active. In terms of the number of miracles goes down. There are no more natural kind of miracles take place. And then God brings the prophets and they bring guidance. But then actually the prophets themselves stop. 400 years before the birth of Jesus, there are no more prophets. And so from a Jewish point of view, they say, well, that's, why don't we need prophets anymore? The reason is God has said and revealed everything that we need to know. Now we, all we need to know is to put it into practice. Now it's our responsibility. We're grown up. We're responsible. And we're the ones that have to make the decisions. And so there's one very famous rabbinic story of some rabbis who are in a, in a room and they're having an argument about the interpretation and the meaning of a particular verse in the Bible. And one rabbi, he thought one thing and all the other rabbis thought something else. And they're all trying to persuade him that he was wrong and that they were all right. And then, they, and then um, <clears throat> the rabbi said, okay, we're going to call on the... On the the, that tree over there to prove that I'm right. So if that tree moves, then you have to accept that we're right and you're wrong. And then this tree got up and it walked around and it planted itself. And then the other rabbi said, since when have we allowed trees, moving trees, to decide what's right and wrong? And then all the rabbis said, okay, we call upon the walls to testify that we're right and you're wrong. So the walls started shaking and almost fell down in the building. And then the other rabbi said, look, walls, stop moving like that. Since when do we allow walls to decide what is right and wrong? Then all the rabbis said, OK, we're going to invite God to come along and tell us what is right and what is wrong. And then a big voice came out of heaven. They're all right, Rabbi Eliza, you're wrong. And Rabbi Eliza said, look, God, you gave us a commandment. You, you're not supposed to be intervening in this discussion. You gave us the commandments. You told us we have to work it out for ourselves. So please go back to heaven. <laughs> and because they had this incredible sense of we're responsible, we have to decide. Anyway, when um, one, one of the prophets went to God and said, you know, what did you think, God, about the way Rabbi Eliza spoke? And God said, he laughed and said, my, my children have defeated me and thought it was really funny and was really happy that his children were being responsible. They were engaging, just like Moses did in the argument. They were participating in the argument. They weren't just sitting back and waiting to be told what was right and what was wrong. But if they thought something was wrong, they were willing to argue with it, you know. We disagree with what you've done about this and this and this and this. And, you know, they call God to justice. And they, in, in one of the death camps, in, not during the Holocaust, the, you know, some of the Jews, they got together, they put God on trial. You know, God, should, you know, God has, you know, is wrong in allowing this terrible thing to take place. And they all found God guilty for allowing the Holocaust to take place. And what do they do next? They all walked off to the gas chamber singing and praising God. And that's just the way they work. 
God is a reality. You may argue with God, may disagree with God, but still God is always a reality. Whereas sometimes when something bad happens, people think, oh, I'm not going to leave. Yes? I'm not going to get involved anymore. You know, I disagree with this, I'm off. But actually the thing is, I left a long time ago in many ways, but I've stayed involved, engaged in the argument. I had so many things which I disagree with, and there's so many things if I disagree with, I think, well, okay, I think that's wrong. I'm going to try and change it, try and make things better. And that was actually the, the faith of Abraham. A very nice story from the Midrash. When Abraham, when he'd left uh, Haran, he was, walking, uh, uh, he was walking along and he saw a palace which was on fire. And he was really surprised. How can there be a palace on fire? Why doesn't somebody put the fire out? And then the owner of the palace said, I'm the owner of the palace. And Abraham thought, why doesn't he put the fire out? And then Abraham realized, I can't remember all the story now, unfortunately, I'm bringing it with me. Abraham realized the world we're living in is a world of extraordinary beauty. Yeah? But there's so much evil going on. And the different ways you can respond to this. You can say, right, there's so much evil going on that God doesn't exist. And sometimes that's one of the reasons why people become atheists. They said, if God really existed, he wouldn't allow so much suffering to take place. And so they say, well, in that case, I don't believe God exists and they become atheists. Other people say, actually, there is no evil in the world. Everything is the way it's supposed to be. If you could just see it from the point of view of the whole or God's point of view or something. The world we're living in is the best of all possible worlds. And, you know, if you understood what was going on here, you'd realize it's not really evil. It's actually okay. That's, you know, and one ends up withdrawing from the world. One doesn't try to change the world. So Abraham's approach was, he knew two things were true. He knew God was a reality from his experience. He knew God was real. God was good and God was real and God created a beautiful universe. The other thing he knew was completely true was there was a lot of evil going on, a lot of injustice. And he said, right, I'm going to put out the fire. God didn't set the palace on fire. Human beings did. I'm going to put out the fire. And so from that moment of Abraham that changed the world, these movements appeared which recognized God is real, there's lots of evil around, I'm going to get involved in trying to make this world a better place. So you have this whole civil rights movement, all sorts of things going on throughout human history from people like this, refusing to accept that the way things are is the way things are supposed to be. And, you know, the Unification Church is no different. The way things are is not the way things are supposed to be. Yeah? The reality is a lot of people thought, well, there's lots of things wrong here, and they left. And most people left, to be honest. And that was sad. I wish they stayed and fought their corner. And there are other people who say, well, actually, what the way things are is the way they're supposed to be. This is the way Father wants it. This is the way it's supposed to be, so stop asking questions and stop complaining and stop criticizing and being so critical. And that's the other approach. And both of these approaches are wrong. Yeah? Neither of these approaches are the approach of Abraham. Neither of these approaches are the approach of Father, indeed, who tried to invest his whole life in trying to change the world. And so our own feelings should be towards our own spiritual community. You know, we're brought here together by God uh, from all parts of the world, you know, to do sorts, all sorts of things. But then to recognize, although there are lots of good things, and family and friends are the most important, probably. There's also lots of things that are not the way they're supposed to be. So we have to get involved in trying to change things, trying to make things better, and uh, trying to move things then onto you know, a different level so that our spiritual community can flourish, can grow, and prosper. All right, I've stood here for far too long as usual. And um, thanks for that uh, intervention there, David. I was glad you did, but I thought you'd do it more often. Thank you. Okay, so let's close with a prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you so much that we can be gathered together this morning. We thank you for our friendship. We thank you for family. We thank you for the principle. We thank you for the incredible things that have been done for our forefathers, the amazing people like Moses who talked to you, who wrestled with you, 
who wrestled to get what was right accomplished. And Father, we want to be like that ourselves. We also want to wrestle with you, with each other, Father, out of heart and out of love because we care. And because we care, we want to make this world a better place. Because we care, we want to improve ourselves and our families and our community as well. So we can be a source of light and inspiration to the country in which we're living and beyond. Because we can see, Father, there's so many difficulties, there's so many things in the world in which we live which, are, which aren't the way they're supposed to be. So we want to take the initiative, Father, and get involved in some way. And through this, Father, we can be a beacon of hope and light in the way that so many other people also are beacons of hope and light. So we want to join together with each other, but also to join together with others, Father, to try to make this world the kind of place which you want it to be, where you can be happy. And I report these things and ask you to accept our prayer in my name. Amen. Okay, so thank you um, for that. Very insightful messages, um, touching on many points in the, in the Old Testament. And um, um, I pray that we can take some of those points and really think what they mean to us and to our lives. So we're going to have an offering song now. Um, so please rise and let's sing. Stop. 
join me in prayer. Our dearest, most uh, beloved Heavenly Parent, true parents, we humbly come before you to offer up this uh, tithing and donation uh, to you, Heavenly Father, and to this community that it can be used for your will and and providence, uh, that we can be an agent of change uh, in the world through this Lancaster Gate community here. We pray that you can use us for your will and providence. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we can be a community that can share our blessings uh, with the world, that we can lead lives that bless those in our workplace, and our tribes, in our uh, hometowns, Heavenly Father, that you can really work through us to uh, bless this country. And we pray as we go out uh, into the world that you can fill our hearts uh, with your love. And I pray and report this now in my name, Robert Haynes, husband of well, bless central couple. Arju. Please seat. So, thank you very much uh, for coming, everyone. Uh, Grant has made a delicious lunch downstairs, I'm sure, and um, also there's the card, which I believe is is somewhere over there. Mr. Hayashi will have it. Uh, please uh, sign it. And um, at one thirty, there's the pastoral care meeting. It'll be in the Kent room. It'll be in the, the it'll be in the Kent room, and the weight will be in here and. Uh, at two o'clock, there will be the Way of Tradition uh, meeting in the cafe. Sorry, did you say wake? Wait, wait. Wait. N- n- yes, yes. Not, no, no wakes this week. Um, yes, so uh, God bless you. Have a good week. Uh, thank you for coming.